Welcome to One Word Stories, episode 30. My name is Joanna Zell, and I'm really, really happy to welcome Kwesi Awudzi. Kwesi Awudzi is a colleague of mine who is very active in the intercultural field, bridging many, many cultures. Above all, uh, he is the managing director at the Culture Beyond Borders, the company, the platform that promotes intercultural exchange uh, between different uh, Western African countries and also the United States, uh, European countries, you name it. Kwesi is also founder and director of the African Cultural Guys Association. And this is actually the context we had the opportunity to meet uh, and also get to know each other better way, because I was really, really uh, amazed about the power of storytelling uh, practices uh, used in the field of traveling when traveling wasn't actually possible. Mm -hmm. When we were traveling, um, Yes, virtually to Uganda and also to Ghana. So this is, by the way, the place of origin. Kwesi comes originally from Ghana, is currently based in the United States next to Atlanta and is spending his time at the moment in Ghana. A very warm yes. welcome, Kwesi. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Happy yeah. to be here. Crazy. First of all, um, you know, this is also one of the storytelling aspects, the story mm -hmm. behind the name, because uh, I'm pretty sure many, many people start the conversation with you. What is special about your name? Can you tell us the story behind? Yes, yes. Um, if you go to Ghana, I always say my name is my uh, Ghana passport because <laughs> um, anybody Ghanaian or familiar with the Ghanaian culture, when they hear Kwesi, will know, okay, that's a Ghanaian because in Ghana, each day of the week um, um, is given a name. Um, so Kwesi is Sunday born, or you will know that the person is born on Sunday if they are called Kwesi. Um, not everybody uses their day of the week name. Some get English name or in Ghana what they call Bible um, names, Christian names. Um, however, I don't have one and I use my day of the week name. So uh, that's another fun aspect of when we take people to Ghana or um, uh, kind of welcoming them back um, into the culture. Um, we ask them to look up their birthday, go all the way back, look up the day of the week you were born, and you will be given or um, initiated um, with your day of the week name. Each uh, uh, culture or each tribe, right? So I'm Fanti, um, which is near the um, southern side of Ghana. And then the Ashanti is near the middle part. Um, and they have a different version of the day of the week names. So Kwesi is Fanti. If you go to the Ashanti, it will be Akwesi. Ah. Um, they'll put an A in front of it. Uh, mine is better, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it's, it, it becomes a cool way to kind of tell who's familiar with the culture, who's been. Um, people proudly use the Ghanaian names to kind of show up. That, yeah, I went, I learned something. So uh, when you come, we'll give you yours. Oh, very, very oh. nice. I need to look it up when I was born, actually, what day of mm -hmm. the week. I think it was Thursday, but this is something I'm not so sure. What makes me also curious, are there any stories, so to say, behind? So, for example, when you are born on a Sunday, does it actually uh, also indicate that you are more relaxed, more laid back? Or <laughs> how can we imagine? There are... The yeah, there are some there are some personality things that go into it. It doesn't play as much of a role, but from what I've noticed, um, I left Ghana when I was young. Um, but from what I would notice, it's not so much personalities, but it is uh, bonding. Mm -hmm. When you meet somebody and they share your day of the week name, it's like, oh, we are brothers or we are sisters, right? Um, so it becomes 
uh, it, it plays a role in the social interactions in the sense that, you know, it's like, oh, that's why we get along. You're also crazy, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I love it. I really love it because this is exactly, you know, the nice, the nice beginning that it's mm -hmm. so obvious uh, to, you know, start um, searching for connection. And uh, this is one of the uh, moments of beauty. Oh, you are also born on that day. That's why mm -hmm. we get along uh, so well. <laughs> it reminds mm -hmm. me a little bit of some attempts maybe in uh, Europe when people are asking you for the uh, zodiac sign. Yeah. Ah, you are yeah. also, I don't know, pieces, Capricorn, whatever. That's why we get along <laughs> so well. When I think of working with stories, what came to my head is actually, of course, the question how did the adventure with storytelling start in your case? Yeah. Um, looking back, it's, I don't know, it's just always been a part of, of my life. Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, born in Ghana, you mentioned as well, um, and storytelling is such an important part of the Ghanaian culture. In Ghana, there's co it's called the Anansi stories. Uh, is based around the animal kingdom. Anansi is the Anansi the spider. He's cunning. He's lazy, um, and so he's always a trickster, trying to um, you know trick uh, the different animals and such. So uh, when we were young, we'll get into you know, story time will circle up and either the kids will make up um, stories about Anansi to each other or um, elders will share popular versions of Anansi stories. And then when uh, I got older and, you know, TV and TV programs become more popular, um, it just got transitioned into a children's program, a youth program where youth will sit around in a circle with an, um, an elder act, a celebrity um, actress, and she will lead them through Anasi stories. And it became like a theater um, thing because the kids will act out, you know, will put face uh, makeup on and put on, you know, you know, adult traditional uh, clothing to act out as the animals. If Anansi is tricking the leopard, um, somebody will, you know, make their voice and make themselves sound like Anansi or sound like the leopard. And there's usually a moral to the story where you shouldn't cheat people, you should be nice to your siblings. So that's, that's, that's my childhood, right? Um, growing up with these stories, both in person and on, on TV. And then I moved uh, to the U.S., um, learning new culture, learning new perspectives, um, and it got me to understand, okay, there's different ways to understand the world and see the world. Um, and when I started with my academic side in my graduate um, career, uh, storytelling became part of how I studied. Right? I studied qualitative data, um, interviews, um, how you uh, use long stories and information you coded and you do all the work with it to get the, the themes out of it. But um, I realized even through that work, I'm still uh, connected to stories more than, you know, surveys and numbers and, you know, big data um, crunching and that side. So i um, linked to it that way. And then what you brought up, the uh, African Cultural Guides Association, uh, through my other main company, Culture Beyond Borders, which um, Culture Beyond Borders sharing the story of the African continent with as many people as possible, because we it does, it's not shared well in media, right? And people have a lot of misconceptions, and it's important to understand various perspectives of what um, the story of the African continent is. And one of the best ways to have that complete story is to come for a visit, right? Um, in that sense, um, I'm happy to be here to talk about stories. As you see, it's it's been part of my life. Yeah, yeah. Started in the childhood in such a beautiful way. And then uh, it's also part of your work. Fantastic. You have also mentioned, you know, that uh, one of the missions of uh, your companies, both of them actually, is the winner rate some misconceptions of Africa. As for my side, I can uh, uh, share in a moment what was really an eye-opener for me when I attended one of your events. However, beforehand, I would like to hear from you what is one of the misconceptions that drives you mad and you really want to uh, re-narrate it? 
that narrative of it's a continent in need right it's a continent that is lacking something it's a continent that um needs the outside to come in to you know um fix address help um whatnot and when i take people i always make sure to let them know where you're going there's greatness you know mm -hmm. there is uh, healthy mindsets there is joy there is family there is love there's all these things that make the people and the culture um, welcoming right so go there with the expectation to learn and to observe something um, and whatever you can contribute to that environment that's all you're doing you're contributing, you're not saving, you're not, you're not making, you know, you're not changing um, lives completely. That's the one that it's like, no. And that's where, what people just see as soon as they get there, they're experiencing the food, they're experiencing the way of life, the people, energy, mm -hmm. energy, work ethic. Um, it's like, wow, there's a lot here. There's a lot of resources here. People are doing a lot with very little yeah. yeah now now think about where you are where you came from how much resources you have and what have you been able to do right yeah. and just observe um with little that um individuals have here what are they able to accomplish yeah yeah thank you for sharing i love it because it's exactly this you know uh, perspective change this is also mm -hmm. something that is actually obvious i mean it's obvious when when we are a little bit familiar with uh, not only ghana but also other african countries i uh, still remember chimamanda zadichi perspective when she shared also that what drives her mad and crazy is that mm -hmm. people refer to africa as a country and not a continent that this diversity of the continent is always, always uh, underestimated. It's much more about talking about tribes than about national identities. And I'm really thankful that you mm -hmm. also uh, referred to it uh, at the very beginning. And this is actually also my takeaway from one of these uh, virtual meetings you have organized when we were, so to say, going uh, through uh, Ghana uh, and seeing it uh, with the eyes of one of the guides mm -hmm. and what he actually did was this uh, fantastic re-narrating uh, practice uh, showing that the places of crime, of trauma, of sadness, of uh, just unbearable uh, moments of uh, detachment uh, during the colonial times, that they are currently also uh, the witnesses of re-narrating and uh, completely new possibilities for communities to gather. So when I think of the uh, Cape Coast Castle and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, uh, this is really the place of abundance. Yeah. So mm -hmm. exactly this is what you have just emphasized, that uh, we shouldn't uh, concentrate so much on the stories on scarcity, but really mm -hmm. on the stories of abundance. So how was it possible? What actually happened in people's mindsets and hearts? Uh, to be able to, to think in that new perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this happens a lot when we're taking um, people to those castles right um and the castles on the top and the hidden at the bottom is the dungeons right so um, the dungeons is what really draws those emotional responses the people the place did not stop in history right mm -hmm. we're remembering a part of the history a very tragic um part of the history right but to be fair and to be more complete, you have to then follow past that, you know, 
tragic period. Um, that's what that cultural guide, his name is Francis. He, I really appreciate uh, how he shares his stories. Did that day when he went to the space outside of that castle where uh, he talked about how the, the original um, people of Cape Coast um, came and settled that beach, um, became fishermen and established a whole livelihood. And then the uh, uh, colonials came and just moved them out of that space, relocated them, right? Took over that beach because they saw that it was economically um, beneficial, it was flourishing and all these things. Um, so they took over that space and take a, took advantage of it for themselves. And then when the colonial period ended, uh, when they were able to move the colonials out, the Cape Coast um, natives came back to reestablish that, that beach, right? And so now that beach is a thriving market again, fish market, fishermen, you, you get your fresh food and stuff there. You can get a lot of, there's life there, right? But if we don't pay attention to life, but we take, only see the past story and tragedy, you don't recognize in full right um the multiple narrative that's happening it's important to have the mindset um that you're going to remember the past yes that's one perspective but you're also going to go gain an, an understanding of the present you're able to actually form relationships and form connections right with people of today in that area rather than just connect to their past Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Definitely, because this is what you are emphasizing currently, the stories of past and the uh, stories of present uh, time, uh, they also impact the stories of the future, of course, yeah. So I really, really like, um, you know, this uh, one sentence, actually, I have uh, caught from Suhaili Nayatullah. By the way, also one of my guests here for One Word Stories, who is a future studies researcher. And he actually said to go on the journey of creating alternative and preferred futures, we need to let go of certain baggage, the weight of history that is preventing us from co-creating the desired future. Yeah, so it's not about uh, forgetting. This is exactly what you emphasize as well. Uh, it's about somehow moving beyond and, uh, yeah, uh, so to say, also yeah. making the space alive again. Yeah. This also brings me to one of the uh, discussions I have had um, about the epigenetics of storytelling that actually at the moment we are aware of the fact that we inherit the stories, uh, let's say, just like we inherit the uh, color of the eyes and color of the mm -hmm. hair and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, and we inherit the emotions that accompany the story. So sometimes even if we are not aware of these narratives from the past, we simply uh, kind of feel the emotions that are part of the story for our great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, uh, and so on and so forth. What has been proven is this inheritance up to the fourth generation. What many, many native um, tribes uh, emphasize is that actually we inherit all the stories up to the seventh generation even so this is also something that you know is uh, very very important in this context of the post-colonial uh, time mm -hmm. but also post-war time yeah so i'm really really grateful for your uh, for your really powerful example what is happening in the in the castle currently or around mm -hmm. the castle better say mm -hmm. Um, when I think of working with stories, I immediately have to also think of, you know, this best practices people from around the globe uh, can share in different contexts. And apart from this uh, traveling uh, context, which is so uh, close to your heart, you have also mentioned that you work with stories in the research context. What do you actually do? How do you do it? Do you work with the narrative interviews? Or what can I imagine? Yeah, um, 
Oh man. Um, <laughs> With my research, and so uh, organizational culture consultant, diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant um, within organizations, um, leadership, um, uh, and team assessment. Uh, these are all the reasons where I use um, the interview skill sets I mentioned, and and even my dissertation. Um, my graduate program was in Iowa, University of Iowa, um, Midwest of the US. And then I went to Ghana for about um, uh, over a course of two years on and off to do an assessment of organizational culture of international hotels. Oh. Um, and I spent time in that space. I, you know, I interned and walk, worked side by side with people. I, then interviewed them to understand their views of what the Ghanaian view of what these international hotels are, are trying to provide for these international hotel guests, right? And these are Ghanaians who never left Ghana, so they don't understand outside what these services look like, you know, service with a smile, the customer's always right. That is mm -hmm. far from true in Ghana. <laughs> that is far from true the the customer is barely right right the customer is lucky if they get acknowledged right but then they come into this workspace where they're supposed to change their mindset completely on top of that these Ghanaians are there they're being managed and it's owned and managed by Ghanaians so the other managers who have traveled understand what that you know, final service looks like, you know, outcome, but have not as much complete understanding on how to get the employees, the staff from the Ghanaian understanding to that outcome because the employees haven't seen what they have seen, right? So they use this Ghanaian way of, you know, do as I say, which is a lot of just um, respect the elder, respect what I say, so kind of punishment-based managing style to provide this happy you know mm -hmm. happy service with the smile outcome which it doesn't work so what does it take to get this understanding you have to enter into the space each organization has its own culture they have yeah. the way of doing this things they mm -hmm. have their rules they have the time you show up they have the way you're supposed to dress they have rules that are written and they yeah, have yeah. rules sure. that are not written mm -hmm. so to enter the space you have to be almost an explorer you have to take uh, uh, have an open mind, hear the stories, um, look for the patterns, um, and piece it all together in a way where even they haven't thought of it the way you have, right? Mm -hmm. um, and because you're an outsider, every little thing comes um, is noticeable. If your country drives on one side of the street and you go to a different country that drives on the opposite side of the street, um, you're, you're just gonna notice every time you're crossing the road, oh man, it's so yeah, new, yeah. Every, mm. the down, it's so new, right? So until these cultural practices are new to you, they're actually unnoticed, right? Um, so that's what um, the qualitative data um, analysis is to find these patterns that go unnoticed um, through interviews, like you said. So either it's through observation, like I did with my dissertation, if we have the opportunities, or through interviews, you sit down, you ask a question and you let the people respond in a story way or just in an open-ended way. And when you give people opportunity to describe something that's very important to them, like how many hours a week you spend at work <laughs> they 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 open up and you know really they don't just answer the question they just answer the question and add some more and add some more and add some more and that's where it's different from the survey where you have the question you have to fill in the blank and you move on yeah you don't really have time for that adds more and a lot of the nuggets the mm. that cultural essence comes out in that Oh, like the other day, somebody said this, da, da, da. and as they're telling you that story, they reveal more than you know they would if you just asked a question and only gave them okay in two sentences to say this. Um, so that's what that experience is: is um, asking for stories, listening to the stories, you know, 
analyzing the stories. And then at the end, I give them a narrative back. Mm -hmm. This is your space. This is how people feel in your space. This is how people um, want to be. This is what you're asking them to do. This is what they can do. This is what they cannot do. Um, this is the assessment. This is how they feel about being in your space, right? Yeah, and people yeah. are like, well, I didn't, I'm not paying them to feel, to feel happy. It's like, well, the work can be done at this level or at this level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If if they show up unhappy, sure, they will do it at this level. But I'm thinking if it's your business, you want them to work at this level where they are giving more than mm. you ask them, right? They, they don't just do this um, one, two, and three, but they have time. So they did four and five yeah. happily, right? Yeah, yeah. And performance, effectiveness, everything goes up when that um, workplace satisfaction or workplace engagement is high. So that's what the qualitative um, uncovers through storytelling. So it's, 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 it's like traveling on a very minor scale because you enter yeah. into these people's lives and you just find out what they've been doing, what, what's important to them. And then, you know, you share it back to them um, when you're done. Yeah, yeah, I love your metaphor with this micro traveling, so to say, because this is really very, yeah. very powerful that you enter their space and uh, you co create with them, so to say, the alternative stories. Yeah, so that you also drive their attention to the possible new um, ways of behaving and even thinking. And uh, this is something that actually uh, just triggers uh, in me one more association that it's uh, also about kind of activating the value of hospitality mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. because of course uh, people in ghana are very very hospitable mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. yes uh, when you when you see mm -hmm. the service in this light that it's about uh, yes doing the best uh, out of your possibilities and really being a good host it completely changes the narrative of uh, being uh, employed at the hotel yes and i always i always i always found it curious you know if you're out in like a community or a village or something in ghana and they see a visitor always offer them food water um you know um in Ghana, uh, this goes to food culture. If you're eating and others are around, part of the cultural practice is to say you're invited. You are to invite all around to share in your food. Mm -hmm. So it's it's you you know you sit down, you're eating. Um, somebody walks into your space, notices you eating. You have to let them know hey, you're invited, you know, mm. if it's one banana, if it's just, you know, you're, you, whatever it is, you're, you're invited. And then obviously the uh, most appropriate cultural response is just say, thank you, mm. go ahead, right? Um, so that is the culture of this welcoming and inviting culture. So the hotels really confused me mm -hmm. when the service wasn't being translated to the hospitality culture. I think it's just so many things. Um, there's no time for relationships to form, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the rules and regulations of the place, while they do want you to provide service, they want you to also like secure the resources, right? Yeah, so yeah. you're not gonna give out so many freebies, right? Mm. It's no longer an environment where it's open, you're open to be yeah. free, like when it was your resources, right? So now you're caretaking somebody else's space and resources. So in those minor ways, the culture doesn't translate within, um, mm into that um, space because it comes with those Western rules of service providing, right? 
it was always challenging. It was always strange, but it didn't translate. And I think because they never felt they could be themselves in mm. that space because of all the rules and regulations. In one way was limiting them, and another way was asking them to give more. In other ways, asking them not to give. And, yeah. You know, yeah. Punishing them. Um, they will do something extra and they won't get recognized or yeah. they won't get rewarded if they do. So it's just, it became very, like I said, the management style and the lack of cultural knowledge kind of made this space of just antagonistic and is the guess who got caught in the middle, right? Because yeah, they yeah, yeah. Mm. didn't get the, the best service. Um, the management wasn't understanding the staff and the staff wasn't uh, understanding the management and their roles. Um, so yeah, 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 it became, it was, I love the space and I made really great connections. People who've been working there 20 years who haven't been asked, how do you feel about this place? Mm -hmm. And they were just so happy to talk to me about it. Um, so uh, it's, it takes some work it takes some work for those spaces to be to merge the local and international and they weren't doing the work to merge it when i bring people i try to find a place where that energy is um where that positive experience is um not just for you know the guests but also for the employees and yes. then find a relationship with the managers and really explain to them okay when my people come here's how it should feel yeah yeah know? yeah and, and, mm. and it, it helps it helps everybody it helps everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, by the way uh, when i hear the word help i also need to of course ask one of these questions i'm asking all oh, my guests what was actually the the word one word that helped you during the covid time uh, wherever you spend it and what is the story behind? Um, yeah, adapting is definitely the word that, that helped me, I believe, both with the people that helped me tell the story and the people who my stories are meant for. And then when people weren't able to travel anymore, I was also thinking of the cultural guides, the um, uh, cultural experts, the people who helped me tell the stories of tradition and art, um, in Ghana and other African countries. And I was like, what are they doing right now, right? Their knowledge didn't disappear. Mm -hmm. their, their passion for what they do didn't disappear. It's just yeah. their audience disappeared, right? And um, uh, more or less on the continent, um, the pandemic has been uh, managed in a way where it hasn't escalated like some of European countries, Asian countries, or even in the U.S., right? So they even had freedom of movement mm. um, domestically. Um, borders were closed, but domestically had some freedom of movement. So that's when I said we need to adapt Mm -hmm. adapt um, to how we tell these stories because there's one way we're comfortable with and we know which is take the audience to the people and have them tell the stories but is there a way to adapt where we take the stories and bring them to the people ACGA um, has an Instagram um, and uh, Facebook where I posted their stories and, you know, ran a campaign for or some time to raise some money for them. Another way is for the students, right? The students is another um, part experiential learning that Culture Beyond Borders enjoyed taking students to the location so that they can have these global and intercultural experience. But again, we needed to adapt how we do that. Can we bring the travel experience to them in the classroom. So this started virtual global learning um, um, component of CBB, Culture Beyond Borders. Uh, and uh, for one of the success stories, we're able to take students in Wisconsin, um, take them to the streets of Uganda. Um, they were uh, talking about health, um, public health and um, the economy. So we were able to talk to farmers, we were able to talk to business owners, we were able to talk to 
medical professionals and clinics in Uganda. We were able to take public transportation via video virtually for them to experience how um, the way of life at this other location is much different from them. And then when after they see the videos, they also got to talk to the people who were in the videos, right? To right. The, medical professional to one of the street size sellers to um, definitely our host who was a, a faculty at a university in Uganda. Um, so um, over the course of two or three weeks, these relationships were formed. So it's about adapting the way we share with one another, right? Um, and I think that's what the pandemic has really opened up. Yes. Fantastic. I'm really, really grateful for all your stories you have shared, all your fantastic inspirations, what is possible actually when we work with stories, yeah? That it's really mm -hmm. about eye-opening, it's really about meaning-making, it's really about mm -hmm. also renovating, uh, and you have given so many powerful examples. I'm really, really thrilled that we have made it to meet virtually. And yeah. And yes. to have recorded this episode. Thank you very, very much. I look forward to meeting you in person, actually, Quasi. Because yes. we have met yes. so many times virtually, it's the highest time to meet in person as well. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you for having me and providing this platform that supports and promotes storytelling. It's amazing. Um, and, and all the work you do, I know it's not easy to put in the effort, but uh, you do it and we are here and we love it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Crazy. Have a wonderful time in Ghana. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.